My name is Ann Albert, and I am the Clatt Family Director for Public Programs at the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. I am very pleased to be here tonight to kick off the beginning of this three-part lecture series um, offered by Professor Noam Pianco. Uh, if you have been joining us for other programs this semester, I wholeheartedly welcome you back. And if this is your first time joining us, I'm really glad to have you. I'm very sorry to say that this course, this three-part series, is uh, our last offering for this academic year. Um, so uh, we just hope to see you again in September for, for programming next year. Um, I'll just say a few words before getting out of the way and letting Professor Pianco take over. Um, this particular type of program, this uh, mini course, which we understand as a set of three to six connected talks on a single topic by one professor, um, allows us to go a little bit deeper into a topic and explore things in a way that's not possible with a single one-off lecture of the kind that you would normally, um, normally see. These programs we started offering here at the Cat Center a few years ago, catering to small groups around a seminar table in person here in Philadelphia. And as we shifted to virtual participation, um, we lost a little of that intimacy, of course, but we've also gained a lot in um, being able to reach more people all over the world and in the fact that we are able to preserve the recordings of these programs. Um, so. If you are interested in other programs like this, you can find on our YouTube channel um, recordings of past courses. There's one on um, German Jewish immigration to Israel in the early and mid 20th century. There's one on Jews in American mass media. There's a lot to explore there. There's also all of our other uh, uh, programming that's been done during this pandemic year. And you'll find a link to those videos um, in the chat. Um, about this course in particular, it, we, we believe right now that this first session will be, re, will be released on YouTube, but, but if you're interested in the second and the third lectures of this series, you'd, be, uh, you'd do best to tune in in person because we're not certain that they'll be, that they'll be released. Okay, so for tonight's program, we could not ask for a more expert scholar or a more excellent teacher to walk us through this history than Professor Noam Pianco. Uh, professor Pianco is the Samuel N. Stroom Chair of Jewish Studies and Professor in the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington, uh, from where he's beaming in to us today. I can see it's still daytime where he is and not for me. Um, um, and where he also directs the Samuel and Althea Stroom Center for Jewish Studies. Um, his first book in 2010 was Zionism and the Roads Not Taken on three key interwar Jewish intellectuals. His second book, um, five years later, was called Peoplehood, an American Innovation, and it won a major prize from the American Jewish Historical Society. Um, that's a book that traces the history of the idea of Jewish peoplehood, which emerged at the beginning of the last century and has shaped discussions of nationalism, Zionism, and American Jewish identity up until this moment. Um, Professor Pianco is also a frequent lecturer and writer in the Jewish community and in the popular press, and we are just very lucky to have him teaching us about this really important and timely and also complex and I think we'll find perhaps surprising topic. So with that, I hand things over to you. Great. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Thank you for that <clears throat> very generous introduction. I've had really a fantastic year as a fellow at the CAT Center. It's been a tremendous honor, and I'm really thrilled that you've included the um, opportunity for us to have chances to teach to the broader publics as well. So thank you for that. Okay, this was my first slide that showed that the, um, uh, the, the two flag images that I talked about, this is not necessarily um, uh, inevitable, there could have been other models and uh, what we are going to be looking at is a much broader way of thinking about Zionism. And here's a kind of a working definition that I'm using in my in my work of how we define what Zionism, at least historically was about a very broad definition that Jews are a national group in need of new frameworks for preserving and enhancing their national identity across homeland and diaspora settings within the global framework of changing definitions of nationalism and citizenship. Basically, if you look back at Zionism, certainly in the first half of the 20th century, the idea of a Jewish state was not what 
the majority of Zionists were thinking about. They were thinking about the uh, definition of Jews as a national group and how that definition of Jews as a national group could be facilitated or what it would take for Jews to reinvigorate their national consciousness around the globe. And some were more on the status side, some were more on the diaspora side, but I'd like to not assume that uh, 1948 and the establishment of the state was necessarily the endpoint of the Zionisms that were brewing in the pre-state period, nor that what ultimately happens when the state does come into existence in 1948, that everybody automatically assumed the state of Israel's definition of what Zionism would be. So what I'm proposing over the next three sessions is to give a slightly different periodization of American Zionisms, right? That, that there's not one Zionism out there, but actually multiple forms. And unfortunately, we have forgotten, I think, some of those articulations of Zionism. And in fact, some of the mainstream articulations of Zionism from the early 20th century would now appear to many of those in the Jewish community as actually being way outside what's acceptable to even say about Israel, especially on questions about dissent and the role of the state and religion in the state. So there's been a lot of changes in terms of what Zionism has articulated over time. And I'd like to think about it in three different buckets. The first is from uh, the 1890s when the first Zionist organizations pop up both in Europe and in the United States until about 1942. And that's what I'll be talking about tonight. And in this period, you have a situation where American Jews are really grappling with what Jewish nationalism could mean in the American context. And it is by no means set in stone or automatically evident. And there is a tremendous amount of debate and disagreement. And that's what I want to look at today. And then we will look at uh, next week, the period between about 1942, and I choose 1942 rather than 1948, because 1942, as we'll get to at the end of today's lecture, was the moment when there was a major conference called the Biltmore Conference at a hotel in New York, where the American Jewish community, especially in response to what was happening in Europe and the Holocaust, came to an agreement on supporting the establishment of a Jewish commonwealth in Palestine. So that really did uh, mark a turning point in American Jewish attitudes toward Zionism. So from that point in 1942, through about 1977, there was a tremendous amount of internal debate about what statehood would actually mean for the American Jewish community. How might that change Zionism that had existed before 1948 or 1942? So that'll be next week. And then in two weeks, we'll look at the period from 1977 to the present. I think it's very much one that we're still in, although there are all sorts of challenges to it, where the Zionisms of, of the first half of the 20th century that tended to really emphasize the importance of a, um, uh, a critical posture toward nation state nationalism and toward just uh, agreeing to do whatever the state of Israel might do and wanted to really affirm the centrality of American Jews in shaping the Jewish national voice shifts towards something that I'm going to call Israelism, which is a real focus on support for the state as the central part of what it means to be a Zionist or a supporter of the state of Israel. And we will get to that in the third lecture in two weeks. So hopefully this will make all of you want to come back for more. So if we want to go back, I think one of the surprising, especially in the context, in today's context, aspects of the history of Zionism in the United States is that not only was it not clear that American Jews would support Zionism, but actually most did not. The vast majority of American Jews did not oppose uh, opposed political Zionism really until the 1940s and even beyond that to some extent. So what today has become, I think, perhaps the most central unifying criteria of the American Jewish community, which is support for the state of Israel, was actually a minority opinion and was deeply challenged by most American Jews until the 1940s. So why is that the case? Well, that's our first question. So to understand that, we will go back and think a little bit about the 
Zionism that was articulated in the 1890s by Theodor Herzl. Many of you have probably seen one of these pictures of Herzl, sort of recognized as the father of, of modern Zionism. And he uh, wrote a famous pamphlet in 1897 that argued that the Jewish people should have a legally secured home in Palestine. And his argument was very deeply based on his assumption that anti-Semitism would not disappear in Europe. And the only opportunity for Jews to uh, uh, avoid anti-Semitism and to be able to live like other Europeans, not necessarily as Jews, but just as human beings in the modern world, was to create a Jewish state. This idea was very deeply rooted in uh, events in Europe, as you may have heard or know about Herzl. Many of his ideas were sparked by his engagement with the uh, Dreyfus affair in France. He covered that as a journalist and his own experiences of anti-Semitism in Europe. And it was not clear at all whether or not this message that was really tailored to a particular moment in Europe would apply in the United States. And the reason for this is the American Jewish community was founded on the idea of American Jews being a, a safe haven for Jews, a, a promised land in its own right, a place where Jews could come. This was a famous uh, postcard that would be sent back. Immigrants would send back these New Year's postcards to their relatives, and it kind of captures probably a, an imagined, very much an imagined sense of the prosperity and the benefits of being in the American Jewish community. But nonetheless, the fact that America was an exception to the European Jewish experience. And therefore, the ideologies, especially ones that espoused nationalism in Europe, would not necessarily be relevant in the American context. And indeed, in the American context, if you look at the fundamental way in which Jews were defined or saw themselves, it was that Judaism was a religion and not a nation in the United States. And there we can have a whole kind of conversation about this question, but it comes down to the idea that in the United States, in order to be an accepted minority, you were much better off being a religious minority, given the way in which the United States recognized a variety of different religious practices, but didn't necessarily recognize minority national groups or um, certainly not racial groups. And at, at that point, uh, race and nation were really closely tied together. So there were all sorts of reasons for American Jews in order to enhance and facilitate their own acculturation into American society, wanted to define themselves as a religion that paralleled a denomination of Protestantism or, or um, rather than a national group. And you can see this very clearly in 1885, which was a, um, a few years be before Zionism kind of takes off in Europe, you have a famous meeting of, uh, 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 of, of, of rabbis, of, of American rabbis who are getting ready to create what will become the, um, the reform movement. At that point, it was just the Hebrew, um, uh, it, was, it was just the, um, uh, uh, it wasn't the reform movement yet because there weren't other movements. There was an attempt to create kind of an American religious American Judaism that would be all encompassing, but um, uh, that's not our topic for tonight. But what I did want to focus on is this kind of founding group of rabbis who write this Pittsburgh platform, which is a fascinating articulation of how they imagined Judaism in the United States. And you can see that one of the, I think there were 10 principles in that. One of them is we consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine nor the restoration of any of the laws concerning the Jewish state. So at the heart of American Judaism was a rejection of Jewish nationalism, and instead an embrace of what was conceived as the opposite way of defining Jews, which were as, um, as a religious uh, faith-based community. And you can see this so visibly in some of the writers and community leaders of the late 19th and early 20th century, Isaac Mayer Wise and Calvin Kohler, two of the um, first presidents of the Hebrew Union College, which was the, the central institution for what would become the reform movement. 
both went out of their way to say that Judaism is distinct from nationalism. And indeed, that um, uh, Judaism could not be tied down to a piece of land. It was distinct from a territory. And there was no way, uh, Kaufman Kohler even went so far as to tell one of the, uh, one of the, the teachers that he would not allow a teacher who was a Zionist to actually trust to, to, to teach biblical exegesis in the, um, in the college, in the Hebrew Union College, which was a expression of how deeply contested and how uncomfortable American Jews were with the very premise of Jewish nationalism. It opposed the idea that Judaism was a religion, a universal religion that needed to actually thrive all over the globe in order to spread its ethical mission rather than being limited to a particular territory and embracing a culture that would distinguish Jews from their neighbors in the United States. There was some interest in Zionism, even though many of the major religious leaders opposed it. The Federation of American Zionists actually was created, the precursor of the Zionist organization brought together a host of different small Zionist clubs that had started to develop in the United States in the 1890s, even a little earlier, into the Federation of American Zionists. In 1917, the Balfour Declaration um, engendered a tremendous uh, enthusiasm for Zionism and uh, uh, Justice Louis Brandeis, we'll talk more about in a moment, became the leader of the movement, which gave the movement a, a much higher visibility and it expanded to about 200,000 people, which on one hand is a large number. On the other hand, we're talking only of about 5% of the American Jewish population. So even with the growth um, around the Balfour Declaration, we still are looking at a very small movement. So what sparks this growth? What allows Zionism to grow, to expand, given the context that we just talked about, where American Jewish leaders were mostly interested, were primarily interested in defining Judaism as a religion? Well, a lot has to do, at least in, in the way that historians have told this story with, uh, with Justice Brandeis. And Brandeis does something very important for the Zionist movement. Here you have a leading American jurist, somebody who has all of the uh, trappings of, a, of, 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 of an American, right? Not, not a particular Jew who looks distinct or has a distinct accent or is coming at this from a particular Jewish perspective, but instead somebody who has all of the authority of a Supreme Court justice and a leader, a legal leader in the country to um, make an argument that basically says, hey, Zionism is not about creating a particular Jewish national identity. It's actually about implementing all of the ideals of American progress in Palestine and to show that Jews and Judaism actually fundamentally share values with American democracy. And the Zionists thus become kind of like the pilgrims, right? They become the uh, spreaders of American democracy throughout the, the, the world. And what it allows Brandeis to say is that American Zionism is not about embracing a distinct loyalty or thinking about moving to another land, Palestine, being patriotic to another land. It's actually about being the best American that you can be because being an American means that you are embracing the values that Zionism also embraces. That's how historians understand fundamentally the way in which Zionism succeeds in the United States. It completely redefines itself. It doesn't emphasize national difference. It doesn't emphasize the need to make Aliyah and move to Palestine. Instead, it focuses on the importance of American Jews to support philanthropically and politically uh, the, the Yishuv, the development in Palestine, and then ultimately the state of Israel, because that is a reflection of what it means to be an American. If you want to look back and see kind of the source of the American and Israeli flags uh, hanging together, it comes back to Brandeis, who shaped this definition. 
And you can see this, he's got a number of really interesting essays that lay this out. Here is one of them. He, right, here's one of them. Uh, he writes, um, let no American imagine that Zion is inconsistent with patriotism. Um, a man is a better citizen in, of the United States for being also a loyal citizen of his state and his city for being loyal to his family and to his profession or trade for being loyal to his college or his lodge. In other words, it doesn't matter if you have multiple connections, as long as those connections are actually equivalent, there's no problem with being connected to the United States and to Palestine or to Zionism, to Jews in Palestine, because ultimately they share the same fundamental set of beliefs. And this language of thinking about Zionism and Americanism as being parallel and even synonymous with one another allows American Jews, whether they call themselves Zionists or non-Zionists, and non-Zionist is an interesting term that we could certainly talk more about where that term comes from and how it's used and whether it's accurate. But the point is that American Jews, because Brandeis created a synthesis of Americanism and Zionism, didn't have to see Zionism as a way of making a distinct cultural or national statement, but instead as a way of expressing their Americanism. And you can see here this image of, the, uh, of, the, of a cover from a, a photo book of the Palestine Economic Corporation, which was a uh, fund created by uh, American Jews to support the development in Palestine. And there's a kind of an image of what does it mean to be a Zionist? It means that you're not making a political or national statement. You are spreading technology, progress, agrarian development all over the globe. And Palestine happens to be the place where the next America will actually form and develop. That's not the entire story of American Zionisms. And this is the piece where my research has been trying to challenge the idea that this easy synthesis developed between uh, America, Americanism and Zionism, and that the way in which American Jews embraced Zionism had everything to do with the fact that Zionism became American and ultimately neutralized many of the more kind of politically charged or cultural claims of European Zionism or Palestinian Zionism, that America did not quite look as different from the European situation in the pre-state period as later historians have wanted to imagine. And therefore Zionism also didn't take on the role from the beginning of being all about being just like an American. It actually also had some real criticism for, um, for American nationalism that I wanted to talk about and share. because I think it's relevant that we don't really have that as part of our historical memory of this period. So if you look back even to Brandeis, this is something that is rarely uh, quoted or, or, or focused on in Brandeis. When Brandeis writes his articles to an American audience about the Jewish question, even the idea of the Jewish question, most American Jews don't think that the Jewish question, the idea of how should the state deal with Jews as a different group was an issue in this country, right? That, that was a European question, not an American question. But Brandeis in the teens very much saw it as an American question. As he talked about Zionism, he talked about the fact that American Jews also have a Jewish question. And it's not surprising, considering that he's writing at a time when Henry Ford is publishing the Elders of Zion in, in his very popular newsletter. You have radio shows that are quite popular that are uh, anti-Semitic in nature. So this is a time when we should be careful not to read back the idea that America was exceptional from Europe. That is easy to have from the perspective of after the Holocaust. But if you look back at Brandeis's period, when many of these Zionists, American Zionists were writing and thinking, they were also quite concerned about American nationalism and about the place of Jews in the United States. And their Zionism reflects this. So 
if you look at the history, for example, of the concept of America as a nation of many nationalities, or the idea of cultural pluralism, that was developed by Horace Callan, who was Brandeis's right-hand man and the leader of the Zionist organization. American Zionists were thinking about questions of nationalism and about the relationship between the state and minority communities in the American context in ways that were quite similar to in the European context. And we can see this, although it's not quoted nearly as often as the other quote that I read earlier about the ways in which being an American patriot and being a Zionist are not mutually exclusive. If you look a little bit more carefully, you can see that Brandeis was really grappling with what it meant to be a nation. He wasn't rejecting the idea that Jews were a nation. He was thinking about what it could mean to be a nation that could be different from having your own state. So for example, Brandeis writes in 1915, a nation may be composed of many nationalities as some of the most successful nations are. The false doctrine that nation and nationality must be made coextensive is the cause of some of the greatest tragedies. So you just have to, in your mind, when he says nation, the word we would use today is state. So what he's saying is a state may be composed of many nationalities and the false doctrine that state and nationality or nations is the word I think we'd use today must be made coextensive is the cause of some of the greatest tragedies. The idea that each state represents one particular ethno-religious group leads to persecution, wars, and intolerance among groups. And the political state that he imagined was one where multiple nations could actually live together. Now, of course, you'll have to think of, in your own mind, huh, isn't the whole idea of a Jewish state precisely trying to build a state that is uh, linked to one particular nation? So you hear you have Brandeis, who is thinking about nationality in ways that oppose what ultimately becomes the definition of Zionism as the creation of a Jewish state that links nation and nationality. And the ideas that Brandeis develops and that many other American Zionists also developed, I think Brandeis actually got a lot of his material from some of these other thinkers, comes from Chada'am, who um, was a Russian Jewish intellectual and sort of the opponent of Herzl. Chada Am developed a concept called um, cultural Zionism. And his idea was that Zionism was about creating an intellectual and cultural center that would then provide national reinvigoration and renaissance to Jews all around the globe. And this was the Zionism that many American Jews and Jewish leaders embraced. It argued that there needed to be a national revival in both homeland and diaspora. Again, something that is absent today from our conception of Zionism, that America is a nation of nationalities. In other words, that America would recognize multiple national groups and that Jews were one of these minority national groups. And that there's actually a way in which the Jewish nation, because it is able to exist and transcend state boundaries and geographical boundaries is actually an alternative to the idea that each ethnic or religious group should have its own state and homeland. So there's actually a fundamental criticism of what ultimately becomes the state of Israel embedded in some of these earlier discussions about Zionism in the United States. And you can see this across a variety of Zionist leaders who today are rarely associated with a criticism of Zionism. And of course, that's why it's important to remember that Zionism can mean many different things and has been different things. Henrietta Zold, for example, the, um, uh, the woman who founded the um, Hadassah was one of the early leaders of the Federation of American Zionists. She is um, a fascinating figure and unfortunately doesn't get the kind of same level of visibility as Brandeis does. And there are all sorts of important questions about gender and how we remember the past. But if you look at, um, at Henrietta Zold, for example, rather than Brandeis, you get a very different model of American Zionism. Henrietta Zold was somebody who 
was very interested in strengthening Jewish national culture. She was also very involved in the Jewish Publication Society at the Jewish Theological Seminary. In fact, she was the founding editor of that series of very important kind of cultural books that came out. Once she moved to Palestine, she worked very closely with Judah Magnus, who's another amazing American Jewish Zionist figure. And the two of them were actually leaders of a group called Ihud, which was advocating well into the 1940s for a binational state of Jews and Arabs in Palestine. So these are kind of traditions and engagements that we hear much less about today, but was a crucial and central part of American Zionism. Another figure who is well known to, to, to most the United States, but especially in Philadelphia because of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College is Mordechai Kaplan. Mordechai Kaplan was uh, perhaps the most important American Jewish thinker. And he's most well known for the fact that he develops a theory of Judaism as a civilization that rejects the concept of a supernatural God and looks at Judaism as a, um, uh, well, he did come, he did use the word peoplehood, and I could talk a lot more about his use of that term. But um, suffice it to say that I think that his notion of peoplehood actually had its origins in his efforts, like Zold and like Brandeis, to rethink the very definition of what a nation is in a way that opposed the association of nation and state. So, for example, Kaplan writes in 1937, the main task of Jewish leadership, and remember this is 37, this is on the, on the cusp of the Holocaust, uh, 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 Nazis are already in, in, in power in Germany, um, uh, Palestine is grappling with the white papers, right, limiting to immigration. It's to define the meaning of nationality and national consciousness in terms that will not only render tenable, but also um, invest with purpose and dignity the status of the Jews who must indefinitely remain scattered among the various nations of the world. He's thinking about how can we understand national identity in ways that reflect the fact that Jews are spread out in different places and that the countries like Germany that have tried to equate nation and state end up being the places that lead to the greatest level of persecution against those who don't fit into that national category that's privileged by the state. Kaplan, and we'll talk more about this next, uh, next week when we look at the period after World War II, but just to give you a, a sense, Kaplan makes this very explicit in 56. He says the state of Israel cannot be a Jewish state. The state of Israel cannot be a Jewish state. This is the most important American Jewish thinker of the, maybe of the 20th century, nor nor can, um, can world Jewry continue to be a nation in the modern sense. The state of Israel will have to be an Israeli state, and world Jewry will have to be metamorphosized into a Jewish people, which is rooted in Eretz Israel, and which has its land of Israel, and which has its branches wherever it is allowed to live. If you were to say today that the state of Israel cannot be a Jewish state, you would be certainly ostracized and um, from the from from the the Jewish community, right? And um, and would be accused of of not allowing the Jewish state that not allowing Jews to have the same opportunity that other religious or ethnic or national groups have. And yet, here's Kaplan who's saying something very different, which is that there is a limitation, there is a problem in a world that connects nation and state. And so Israel should see itself as a nation of, of, um, of Israelis, not necessarily of Jews. And that uh, parallels the way in which the United States should see itself as a nation of many nationalities. So this, these debates about Zionism between those that were looking at Zionism as the beginning of a political project and upbuilding the land toward the state and those who were looking at Zionism as a mode of national regeneration and actually also as a criticism of the very idea of a nation state, that debate takes a pause in the 1940s. Once the um, Holocaust and the destruction and genocide becomes clear and American Jews feel that they need to rally together, they have a conference called the Biltmore at the Biltmore Hotel in New York and uh, there is a united call for the fulfillment of the Balfour Declaration. 
and for the creation of a Jewish commonwealth. It's interesting that state is not used here. We can talk more about that, but they talk about a commonwealth. But overall, there is a um, uh, uh, an agreement, a consensus reached, or at least a pause on the debates that I've been talking about for the Biltmore platform. But that doesn't necessarily mean, this is from a, a sign in Israel, and for those of you who um, can read Hebrew, you can see that it says Rehov Biltmore, it's Biltmore Street. Lots of streets in Israel have names that are named after important events, especially in Zionist history. And it says uh, Malone in New York, a hotel in New York, in which the discussions took place on the issue of the founding of a independent and sovereign Jewish state. So this in the memory, in the, in the memory of the street signs in Israel, and you can learn a lot just by reading the street signs in Israel, in the memory, and I think in the Israeli memory, and maybe even in our own memory of Zionism, we look back at the Biltmore Con uh, conference and kind of read back that there was an agreement at that point and probably even before that American Jews were discussing and, and advocating for the creation of a sovereign Jewish state. And yet, as we just saw, you have leading American Jews who are challenging that idea way beyond 1942. And we'll look more at that in the next in the next lecture. And I will just end with this slide, which is we started with what are the assumptions about Zionism uh, today? Well, if we look back and we try to do that exercise in the 1940s, what might we find? Well, we'd probably find that Jewish nationalism is, and Zionism is really applicable both in diaspora and homeland. It's not just about advocating or supporting a state. It's actually about national regeneration in the diaspora. That Jewish nationalism was understood by many in Zionism as a form of political collectivity that actually opposed on ethical and moral and pragmatic grounds the nation state model of the relationship between national groups and political entities. And that um, uh, American Jews should be central, a central address for determining the decisions or the direction of the Jewish nation, not just the state of Israel, but actually American Jews should have a central role in shaping national policies. And finally, it would have been, I mean, impossible to talk about a relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism at that point in time. And I just think that's something that's important to remember, especially today, as we are debating these questions in all sorts of important ways. So I'm going to stop there and I am going to get my Q&A box up and I am going to encourage you all to take a moment and um, any questions that you have, if you type them in the Q&A box, I can then try to answer as many as I can in the next 15 or 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to take a little drink here while you collect your questions and then I will um, try to answer them. Okay, so I have a few questions coming in. Please continue to type your questions and to um, share any questions or comments you might have. The first question is, um, what was the impetus for Balfour to issue his declaration? This is a complicated question. The Balfour Declaration is the document from the um, uh, that the the, the the Great Britain put out that declares the goal of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Um, it explicitly talks about the homeland not doing anything to undermine the um, the rights of any religious or national minority, but it does focus on the creation of a, a homeland. What's fascinating about the Balfour Declaration is, first of all, it was made in. Um, uh, in 1917. So it was made at a time when it wasn't even clear which European power at the end of World War I would be in charge of that part of the world, of, of the later day Palestine. And the other challenge with the Balfour Declaration was that Great Britain, um, uh, they sort of hedged their bets in the sense that they actually also promised Palestine to other groups. For example, they were very interested in King Faisal, who was um, king of the Hejaz, which is the area that is now Saudi Arabia. 
and um, they wanted King Faisal to help in their efforts to defeat the um, uh, to defeat the um, uh, Turkish uh, Turkish forces. This is World War One, where the Ottomans were fighting against the um, the British, and so they also promised Faisal a very large area of land, and they also made a deal with the French in something called the Sykes Pico uh, Agreement that ultimately um, made an agreement with the French about uh, who would have control over both Lebanon, Syria, and also Palestine. So this is kind of an example of um, uh, trying to uh, balance various war aims. And that's not the way that it's often kind of understood in, in um, uh, you know, the way that um, uh, those I mean, it is, it is held up as the, one of the main justifications for the modern state of Israel. Um, in its historical context, there are all sorts of ways that you can see that it was part of a, um, a historical set of debates and who has the right to give a, a land and was that even Great Britain's to give. And so there are all sorts of questions that it raises, but that's a little bit about the impetus for the declaration. You have to look at it in the context of the effort uh, by Great Britain to uh, merge victorious in World War I. Um, okay, can, uh, let's see, can I speak a bit more about um, uh, Magnus? Uh, it says Stoltz, but I assume that's um, Zold uh, and, um, and their theories of binational state. Thank you. Uh, so the idea, one, one, one piece that is, is um, I think most surprising, and that's one of the areas of, of scholarship on the history of Zionism that I think has been most interesting and, and important over the last few years, is to demonstrate the fact that until about 1940s, most leaders of, of, of the Zionist movement, including people like Ben-Gurion and Jabotinsky, were not actually advocating for uh, a Jewish state. Many of them had various ideas about how Palestine and the Jewish national presence in the Yishuv would be part of a multinational empire of some sort. You have to remember that from their perspective in the 1930s, the British Empire was still in control of many colonies, imperialism was still going very strongly, and there were still multinational empires. And that was the model within which many Zionists were thinking. And the idea of a binational state emerged out of this idea that I've been talking about that national groups don't necessarily need to have their own states, that there can be other models. A lot of writers in the early, in the first third, even later of the 20th century, looked to Switzerland as a model for what Palestine could look like. The idea that you could have one state with multiple minority national communities who all would have representation within parliament of some sort. And that was the model that folks like Magnus had in mind for a binational state would be uh, you would have some degree of cultural autonomy and uh, a mode of actually governing the, the politics of either the state or within a broader empire together in ways that reflected the population. Um, you know, depending on, on how you understand what, what took place in the 1930s, whether or not that was ultimately possible given the level of, um, of really violence that had taken place by the, the late 30s and early 40s is um, uh, it's probably unlikely, but it's important to recognize that there were a lot of different visions of what a multinational state in Palestine could have looked like. And it wasn't clear that a Jewish state alone was going to be the solution that would develop. I have a question here about the consensus definition of Zionism today. Okay, let me put that up there. Um, oh, sorry, today, that would be the first slide. Okay, let me, sorry about that. I think that's the opening slide. Um, is there a question, whoever wrote that? Um, does anybody wanna add a question about that slide that I can talk about? Do you think I got that right, not right? Let's see, I think that was it. Any other questions around that? And if there are more questions, please feel free to put those in too. Let's see, Q and A. Um, okay, I see an interesting question that just popped up. Let me get to that one. Oh, never mind, we're going to. Um, 
Um, okay. So, sorry, just trying to, okay. I see there's a, is there a chat? Oh, okay. So, um, okay, good. There are a few other ones to go to. So, uh, a question that, um, to add to a list, how do the ideas of, um, of peoplehood, how do, how do, how do, how do the idea, how, how does the idea of peoplehood and nationality that were new in the early 19th and 20th century relate to traditional um, Jewish ideas of the nation, i.e. Am Yisrael? I assume Kaplan was in dialogue with this concept. What about Brandeis and others? This is a very good question. Zionism understands itself as the fulfillment of a 2,000-year-old Jewish self-understanding of itself as a national community. And um, that often relates to the term Am Yisrael or the nation or the people of Israel. It's very interesting if you look at a modern dictionary, Israeli dictionary of the word Am, uh, the word that is it means is a leum or a state, basically. So, um, uh, so uh, sorry, a, a, a national group. So there is a connection in modern Hebrew, and I think in the modern Zionist mentality, that the words in Jewish sources that say Am Yisrael are the same as the term the Jewish nation in the present. And there are some ways in which those terms are similar. They're both referring to a collective group, but they mean something very different. And I think that's important to point out. The modern term nation refers to a, um, a group that lives in a particular territory, often shares an imagined um, uh, uh, historical past and shares a, a, a language and culture, and is usually secular. The concept of Am Yisrael, at least in terms of the um, Jewish tradition, is much more closely related to a theological and religious narrative. And it's connected in some ways to a place in that there's a historical attachment to a place and a future attachment to the place, but that's never a core part of the definition of Am Yisrael. So one of the things that modern Zionism did was it took a concept that was primarily religious in orientation, theological in orientation, and converted it into a modern term of nationhood. And that, again, was not inevitable. And if you look in the pre-1948 period, you can see that figures like Kaplan and Zold and even Brandeis were challenging that idea. But I think we've lost that. It's very hard to separate between the biblical idea of Am Yisrael and the modern secular idea of the Jewish nation. Um, okay, let's see. Um, recently, there has been a lively debate about the use of population genetics in the construction of nationhood. As you probably know, studies of Jewish genetics are part of the conversation as it pertains to land rights in Palestine. Do you have any thoughts about the uses and our hazards of this sort of data in nation construction and sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the Zionist project? <sighs> Interesting. Uh, I am not an expert in terms of um, genetics. I think the, the closest kind of complication is the tension around um, <sighs> defining Jewish collective group and its relationship to um, biology and even racial categories. And there's a, a tension, I think, between wanting to have the historical validity of being able to make a genetic claim that Jews can trace their uh, genetic material back to a shared place in the past, which would allow Jews to say, Jews have always been a, a collective group and have been at this place because from a, a Zionist view of the world, the Jews were a collective group they moved as a collective group to other parts of the world. And that same collective group had kids and kids and kids, and they came back together to the place they've always been, right? So that's kind of the, the modern narrative of Zionism. And genetics can be used to prove that, to disprove that. And I think, um, uh, so that, that's what's at stake in terms of looking at those genetic questions. Uh, there are, you know, depending on your, on your view of the world, right? There are advantages or disadvantages to that approach. I think for those who are interested in trying to make a clear claim that um, Zionism, that Jews are kind of, the, the Zionism is a return 
of this historical group of people who have always remained the people back to the land that has always been their land, then genetics can be a powerful tool. If you are a, um, uh, if your understanding of Judaism is less focused on the centrality of race and more, or, or biology and more on culture or belief, then maybe those um, genetic models are not the ones that will be most appealing to you. I see a lot. Okay, so a question that says, um, yes, okay. Um, I, see, I see a lot of people uh, today saying that Zionism equals colonialism. What do you think about that and how to respond? That is a, a good question. This is why I like to be a historian and not a, um, you know, a contemporary uh, analyst of, of some of this material. Um, you know, historically, especially in the period pre-1948, the, um, you know, the Zionists themselves um, uh, saw themselves as being um, part of a, a colonial, you know, they called what they did colonial, they, they used the word colonialism, they used the word colonies, that was the language that they used. And as Europeans, that was the, the way in which they, they saw the world. And, you know, they saw what they were doing as trying to bring European um, ideals and European technology and European developments to different parts of the world. And you can see that, for example, if you read, Herzl has this fascinating novel that he wrote called Alt Neuland. And in that novel, he traces these three Europeans who travel to the future land of Palestine. And they bump into a local um, uh, Palestinian uh, Arab uh, who is working the land and they say to this Palestinian, and, and Herzl kind of imagines how this Palestinian Arab would respond to these um, uh, to these visitors. And the visitors say, "Well, what do you think about all these Jews who have showed up here?" And the um, I think his name was Rashid Bey, who was this you know a, a fellaim, somebody who was working the land, says, "Oh, it's been wonderful. Our Arab production has gone up considerably. Everything here is so much better. I'm I'm so excited to be part of this kind of uh, project." So in the minds for many um, Zionists, this was um, uh, understood through the same lens that uh, Europeans saw their um, imperialism and colonialism throughout the, um, throughout the world in this period. So Zionism does have its, Zionism's history is, co is connected to colonialism. Um, you know, the, the more political question then comes in to um, later questions about how does that impact your understanding of um, the connection and claims to, <clears throat> to statehood and to relationship to the Palestinians? And um, I think today the main question is actually about whether or not um, uh, the settlers in the West Bank, whether that's a um, something that's called settler colonialism, which is a type of colonialism that is not the type of colonialism where you would have kind of the state who would send out some people and then they would get whatever they wanted, resources, and bring it back, but instead actually more the model of Australia, or in fact the United States, you can see really as settler colonialism, where you have um, immigrants who go to another place and they intend to stay there and they settle that land and often in doing so, they disenfranchise the indigenous population. So I think the, the question about colonialism, there are really two questions. One is, what was the relationship to the colonialism uh, of an imperialism of, um, of of Britain and Europe in the interwar period? And the other is how does the post sixty seven engagement in the West Bank relate to settler colonialism? Are they related? Or are they not? And that's one of the issues that is um, debated and contested. Anti Zionism. Okay, this is um, a, a last question I'll, I'll take. Um, do you want to say anything about anti Zionism within the Jewish community before 1948? You know, like many antis, you can't have an anti until you have the pro or something, right? So the, the more formal anti uh, American anti Zionism develops in the um, after the Biltmore Conference, right? So before the Biltmore Conference in 1942, there, you know, I, I think there's there's a tepid um, uh, either support. There's there's the, the the most category are what we call like non-Zionist, which means that you know Jews need places in the world as refuge, and Palestine should be one of them. 
but we don't necessarily believe that they should be there toward any kind of political or, or you know, ends, nor do we believe that American Jews themselves or that Jews constitute a nation. And there are also many folks who didn't see that as important or disagree, but because there was no clear advocacy for a Jewish political entity in Palestine, because that consensus only develops in 1942, kind of the more formal anti-Zionism only makes sense in opposition to that and that develops in the 19 in the late 1940s and then in the 1950s as well. So the very idea of anti-Zionism only makes sense once there develops a consensus that Zionism is about creating a state. And before 1942, and certainly, and you know, even before 1948, that consensus doesn't exist. So anti-Zionism doesn't really make a lot of sense. Who you would call an anti-Zionist today? You would call a Am, You would call Mordechai Kaplan, right? One of the leading American Zionists and Jewish religious thinkers. Today, you would call him an anti-Zionist because he was saying that there should not be a, there should be an Israeli state, not a Jewish state. That is a fundamentally, from today's perspective, an anti-Zionist claim. And yet we have a leading American Zionist from the, you know, who died in 1981, I think, or 83, 80, 83, 102, who died in 1983, who was um, uh, advocating for not having a Jewish state, but instead an Israeli state. So that term itself is one that didn't always exist because there wasn't a clear definition of what to be anti. And folks who held what today would be called anti-Zionism were actually mainstream Zionists um, for much of American Jewish history. And I think that's kind of a, a good place for me to end tonight is to say, this is exactly what the question for the next class is gonna be is, how do we go from a time when somebody like Mordechai Kaplan or Henrietta Zold, who's, who's engaged in this binational project and Judah Magnus, how do we go from a moment when that's what American Zionism, that, that's what the leaders of American Zionism were espousing. They were nervous about the nation state. They were critical about, um, uh, they, were, they were interested in defining Jews as a nation in America. How did that switch so radically? What happened? So next week, what we will look at is we will think about the way in which the events um, between 1942 and 1977 really transformed American Zionism. Uh, and there was a, through a, a debate about what the role of the state could be uh, going forward. So I will uh, end there. Hopefully that gives you something to look forward to for next week. There is no homework, don't worry. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to um, uh, reach out and um, I'm happy to answer more questions next week. Good night.